God's Word brings people to faith, it enables people to grow in faith, and it encourages people in turn to share their faith. The grass withers, the flower falls, but the Word of the Lord will stand forever. Christianity is about the wonder of what Christ has done. He loved you before the dawn of time. The answer to our broken world is found only one place, at the cross of Jesus Christ. By nature, man is in rebellion against God. By nature, man says, I'll do this my own way. By nature, man says, I don't like that idea. I have another idea. I have another plan. And it is impossible for man to continue down that road without it actually having an impact in all these different ways. With that said, here's the bigger deal. The real issue, the real concern, and this is where I find myself stopping during the week, what is most alarming to me is not that that view exists outside the church, but that that view is beginning to exist inside the church. That within the realm of Christendom, those who apparently profess to believe the Bible are now, for whatever reason, prepared to tamper with the Bible, to readjust the Bible, in order to accommodate oneself uh, to the thoughts and mores of the day. The real issue, the real question is, does the church believe the Bible? Or, more pointedly, does this church believe the Bible? Or, narrowing it down, do you believe the Bible? Or, even more so, do I believe the Bible? It's my second word, inspiration. Inspiration. Because, you see, what is at stake here in this matter, and it is not unique in this realm, but this is the realm in which it is most prevalent for us to face, is the question of the inspiration of the Bible itself. How is it that we have the Bible? What is the Bible? Why is the Bible authoritative? You remember those of you who were around at the threshold of the new millennium 17 years ago, and we said, as we look out on the future, probably it will be as in the past. People will challenge the exclusive claims of Jesus, and they continue to. They will challenge the authority and sufficiency of the Bible, and they continue to. And we said that will probably be revealed most expressly in the question of human sexuality in the matter of gender. Few of us understood how prophetic that last observation was, and few of us could ever have anticipated the speed with which the question of gender would monopolize this space on the, on the, uh, the, 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 the context of conversation uh, in this realm. And here we have it. Why is it, then, that there is, as I suggest to you, a retreat within the confines of Christendom from the clarity and authority of the Bible? I think the answer is very simple. It is on account of an unwillingness to uphold a Christian view of marriage, which is governed entirely and solely by the teaching of Scripture. It lies in unbelief in the infallibility of the Bible. So, for example, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. That little phrase there is like a lightning rod, even in a congregation like this. I can't see it, but I'm sure it's happening. Certain ladies are sitting up a little higher in their seat. And they're bristling at the very thought of it. That this thing is, is it people actually believe this kind of thing today? Who's going to speak to this? Well, you see, do you believe the Bible? Remember, Augustine said, if, if you believe what you, what you like in the gospel— and you reject what you don't like, it's, the go it's not the gospel you believe, it's yourself. So, if you believe what you like in the Bible, and reject what you dislike in the Bible, then it's not the Bible you believe, it's yourself. Incidentally, and I think it's worth just pausing on this, it is clear to me that it is possible 
for men and women to get very, very agitated about the very issue of marriage and gender and so on from different perspectives without any recourse to the Bible at all. And some of you may be just like that. You're confusing your political reactions with genuine biblical responses. It is very, very possible to be politically agitated about these things, and yet not actually to be Spirit-led and Bible-taught. Therefore, we shouldn't assume that because we feel a certain way that it is an evidence of the fact that we have come to believe in a certain way, and that it is that belief which then reveals itself in that way. Paul, when he writes to Timothy, remember in 2 Timothy 3.16, says to him, he says, Timothy, all Scripture is inspired by God. He wasn't informing Timothy of something that he didn't know. He was reminding him of what he knew. That Timothy knew that as he has read the Old Testament, the Word of the Lord came, and this is the Word of the Lord, and this is God's Word, and so on. Timothy believed that. And in fact, the, the very verb that Paul uses is a unique verb in the New Testament. Some have even suggested that he coined the verb himself in order to make the point. The point being that when we talk in terms of the inspiration of the Bible, it is not something God breathed into, but rather it is something that God breathed out. That the Scriptures are not a human product um, infused with divinity— but they are actually a divine product produced through human instrumentality. So there's nothing like it in the whole world. That's why we've spoken in the past of the dual authorship of Scripture, that when God wants a book like Romans to be written, he raises up somebody like Saul of Tarsus in, in order that he might be the one who is able to write it, which, of course, he did. For the record, and just so we understand how we are with one another— it's important for you to know that I believe that every book, chapter, verse, and syllable of the Bible was originally given by the inspiration of God. That is my own personal conviction. Bishop Ryle, in the 19th century, writes as follows, "'Inspiration is the very keel and foundation of Christianity. If Christians have no divine tool to turn to, as the basis of their doctrine and practice, they have no solid ground for present peace or hope, and no right to claim the attention of mankind. No right to claim the attention of mankind. See, what is the basis on which we can say to our culture, hey, it's not the fact that we're annoyed about things. It's about the fact that we believe the Bible and that the message of the Bible is the message of how God comes to repair and to restore that which is broken and destroyed and mangled and messed up, and that the agony of God for a world that has turned its back on him has gone to the extent of him sending his Son in order to make a, an atonement for our sin and rebellion against him, that that is at the heart of it all. It's not simply that we're annoyed that America is not the way that we wanted it. That, that can come and go. Now, in saying all of this, I recognize that, as with other areas of Christian doctrine, uh, this is difficult. It's difficult. Uh, but the fact that it's difficult doesn't mean that it should be set aside. Many of you are involved in science. There isn't a science in the world. There isn't one in the entire world about which questions may not be asked, which no one can answer. It hasn't stopped your research. You don't know the answer to all the questions. And the fact that I don't know the answer to every detail about the inspiration of the Bible does not call in question the Bible's claim for itself. It is a difficult doctrine. It is a biblical doctrine. It is an essential doctrine. Think about it. What is the point of me even going into verse 22 and continuing to expound Ephesians chapter 5? if we don't believe that every word of this book is inspired? What's the point? There is no point. Why teach the Bible at all? Incidentally, that is why so many don't teach the Bible. That's why, more than any other reason. It's not that they don't study. They study. 
They don't believe it. So if you don't believe it, why would you then teach it? Why not just say pleasant things that will be encouraging to relatively pleasant people and have everybody go on their way home? No, this is something far greater than that, something far more significant. Now, when you come to the Bible itself, when you read the Bible, there are certain things that, that affect us, if you like, objectively. There are, there are matters that we can consider, and we could go through a whole ton of them. But I just wrote another word down to help me remember. I wrote down the word hams, H-A-M-S. All right? Hams. So I could remember four words. The first word is harmony. Harmony. So I just say something concerning the harmony of the Bible. How, how do we account for the harmony in the Bible? Written by over 30 authors over a period of 1,500 years or more, and yet all of them, although most of them never ever had any contact with each other, are telling the same story, giving the same account of the human heart, and telling the same wonderful way of salvation through the sacrifice of the Lamb of God, all the way from Genesis to Revelation. I challenge you, read it and consider the harmony that is there and how it got there if God is not the author of the book. A, for accuracy. What other book written, finished some 2,000 years ago, is still being read today? What other book written some 2,000 years ago still stands up to the challenges of today, to the questions that confront philosophy and confront science and confront life itself? And people are able to go into this book, and they've traveled the world, and as they've gone here and there in the world, they have never found anything that calls in question the accuracy of the Bible itself. M for majesty. Majesty. Every honest, every unprejudiced reader has to see that there is a great gulf between the Bible and any other ancient text that may be produced. People are not still reading the works of Thucydides, unless they're trying to get a PhD. They're not dealing with Diocletian. The Bible transcends any consideration that you might find in the work, for example, of the Koran, or the Book of Mormon, for that matter. I think the reason God allowed the Book of Mormon to be written was so that people could look at it and say, that's not possibly true. That is unbelievable. You're right, it is unbelievable. No one has ever produced anything close to the Scriptures themselves. It's majesty. And S, it's suitability. It's suitability. Some books fit a certain place geographically, a certain time, a certain person. I mean, I don't read cooking books. I don't, you may. There's nothing wrong with it. It's very helpful if you want to cook. I'm not really much into reading science books either. You read science books. Every so often someone gives me one, I try my best. And we would, if we said to one another, tell us about the books on your shelves. But you see, the Bible transcends this. It transcends time and culture and gender and intellect. So you can really bright fellows on their knees in the morning reading their Bibles. And little old ladies in the remote parts of the Outer Hebrides, on their knees in the morning, reading the same book. University students and boys and girls at school reading their Bible and discovering that the truth of God's Word is impacting their lives. The Bible is the first book which fits the mind of the child in considering religion at all. And the Bible, if you like, is the last to which an old person clings in the prospect of eternity. You don't find too many people on a lifeboat dissing the Bible. Remember the old story about the Scottish uh, fellow who was out on the lifeboat, and the, the thing began to get completely out of control, and uh, 
the, the, the captain of the lifeboat said to this man who was unduly anxious, he says to him, he says, you, don't you worry about a thing, he says. We have, we have, if there's anything goes wrong here, he says, we have, we have water on board, we have a chocolate on board, and we, and we have a copy of the Holy Scriptures. And the man says, well, the latter is irrelevant to me. I am an atheist. And the captain said, there are no atheists in lifeboats. The suitability of the Bible is hard to deny. Listen to this quote, then I'll tell you who it's from. I have always been strongly in favor of secular education in the sense of education without theology. Okay? But, says this individual, I must confess that I have been no less seriously perplexed to know by what practical measures the religious feeling which is the essential basis of conduct, could be kept up in the present chaotic state of opinion on these matters without the use of a Bible. That's, that's Aldous Huxley, my second favorite atheist. My favorite atheist, Hitch, second favorite, Huxley. Because Huxley was honest. Remember, Huxley's the one who said, I decided I didn't want to believe in God. I didn't want to believe in God. Because if I believed in God, then I would be held accountable, and I didn't want to be held accountable. So I decided I don't want to believe in God. Here he's honest enough to say, I've always been a great fan of taking education and removing it from the realm of theology, removing it from the realm of the Bible. He says, but as I think about it, how then in the world are we going to have the capacity that somehow or another is inherent in the Bible instilled in the lives of those who are the students now? We could go on and on with objective things, but here's the, here, here I want to point out to you. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, a man or a woman will only become convinced of the authority of Scripture by Scripture itself. You cannot, you cannot appeal to a higher authority than the one who has written the Scriptures. So Scripture interprets itself. J.C. Ryle, once again, our full persuasion and assurance of the infallible truth and divine authority thereof is from the inward work of the Holy Spirit, bearing witness by and with the Word of God in our hearts. The witness of the Holy Spirit working by the Word of God and with the Word of God and within our hearts. In other words, the same Spirit that inspired the Word illumines the Word, and convinces us that it is the Word. That's how. And that is actually only how. Now, Rembrandt has that amazing painting, remember, of, of the woman, old woman, reading the Bible. In fact, apparently his mother sat for it as the, as the model. And if you know the painting at all, and if you don't, you can Google it, and don't do it right now. And. Um, <laughs> And you will see that the Bible itself appears to be actually illuminated from within. And of course, that was the point that, that Rembrandt wanted to make, that the illumination came from the very text itself, that it wasn't something that was shone from the outside into it, but it was something that was inherent in the very text itself, whereby the same Spirit that had inspired its writing was now the one who illuminated its truth and brought conviction to the heart of the skeptic. By the way, in case you've forgotten, this is an introduction to marriage. I just thought I'd bring that back. <laughs> the point is straightforward. We will never think rightly about marriage until we are convinced of the divine origin of Scripture. The only way you can go at it, then, is, is, is just as a pragmatist. There are certain principles here that might be helpful for us, and so on. Some ideas, some concepts. I can apply them if I choose. I disregard them if I want. There's nothing here that is of divine authority. There's nothing here that makes me have to do anything at all. I mean, I might see that it's valuable to love my wife as Christ loved the church, but there again, I don't really like to do that most of the time, and so why should I? Well, of course, you shouldn't, unless God's Word is true. It's absolutely vital for the church 
is vital for our church. It's vital for our church. This is the great issue for our church. When we talk about bringing on interns, when we talk about establishing new elders, when we talk about passing from one generation to another, listen and listen to me carefully. We cannot, dare not, ever deviate in this matter. For the authority and sufficiency and inerrancy of Scripture is absolutely foundational to the ongoing work of God. Remember, Jesus said, Father, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. When Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, he commended them as a church. He said, We thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God. You heard it, you accepted it, not as the word of men, but as it really is the word of God. Vital for the church, vital for us as individuals. Before Paul writes the 16th verse of 2 Timothy 3, he writes the 14th and 15th. As for you, Timothy, continue in the things that you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned them, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith and Jesus Christ. I I do not allow myself the luxury of giving you names and places from the last 30 years here in the United States of men whose books we may once have read to our benefit, whose sermons we once heard to our good, but who today are nowhere in relationship to the things of God for one single solitary reason, that they have turned their backs on the inerrancy and infallibility and authority and sufficiency of the Bible, and confused and corrupt thinking about marriage is directly tied to a loss of that authority and an understanding of the doctrine of Christ and the church is the foundation of the doctrine of what it means for myself and my wife and for you and your future. You see, I was thinking a lot about this. Even as I was driving this morning, I said to myself, you know, it has to be that way. It has to be this way. Because I've got no explanation for why I believe the Bible. You see, if you had to have a certain intellect, I wouldn't, I'd flunk out on that basis. Or if you've got to be a complete and utter dimwit, well, that's possible. <laughs> but no, you see, it's the same spirit that inspired it, that illumined it. And I'm glad there's lots of boys and girls here this morning. Because I guess these convictions came to me when I was the age you are. I, I, I'm paying attention to that. Continue in the things of which you've become convinced, knowing those from whom you learned it. And how from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation. That's, that's all we have. You see, if the Bible is not this, then we are actually involved in the greatest fabrication that the world has ever seen. I have lied my way through every funeral service I have conducted by assuring men and women that for the believer to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. On what possible basis can you say that? On the authority and sufficiency of the Bible. Nothing else. I've got nothing else, and neither do you. 
Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it weren't so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Do you believe that? <laughs> Why? It seems strange, doesn't it? Everybody says when you're dead, you're dead. Hinduism says you get about 47 chances at it. You go around and around and around. Do you believe that? Really believe that? You see, that's the work of the Spirit of God. It's fantastic. Father, do your work within our hearts and minds in these days, we pray. Keep us, Lord, in the fullness of your love so that we don't become hypercritical and judgmental of a world that uh, is broken and trying to figure it out. Help us, Lord, to be uh, like lifeboat people for wrestlers, wrestlers on, this, on the sea of life, that in the winds of change and the philosophies of man. Help us not, Lord, to become anything other than um, Christ-like, both in gentleness and boldness. And as we prepare to work our way through these difficult matters of what it means to be husband and wife and to live according to your plan, I grant that we might come to it with the conviction that your word is fixed in the heavens, that it is true, that it transcends culture and time and speaks to our lives. Prepare us for this, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.